So we decided we would need to start something over again. And, and the question was, do we leave the word organic behind and give it to them? Um, or do we fight for it? And we decided to fight. So we started the Real Organic Project. And we made the debatable decision to use USDA certification as, as a foundation and that we would do an add-on to that. And unfortunately, that disqualified my good friend Elliot and my good friend Barbara, wherever she is in here, from being certified with us because they wouldn't stoop to USDA certification, which I respect. But um, USDA certification does a lot of good work. It's just the little bit of bad work they do is terrible. And it's, you know, the vast majority of certified organic farms are really organic. A small number of certified organic farms are not really organic, and they sell a lot of what gets sold under the organic label in America. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of the Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label to distinguish organic crops grown in healthy soils and organic livestock raised on well-managed pasture. You just heard from Dave Chapman speaking to an audience of chefs, doctors, nutritionists, farmers, and others that are interested in the quality of our food. They were at Stone Barn Center for Agriculture. Dave is joined on stage with the Stone Barn's farm manager, Jack Algier, and renowned organic farmer, Elliot Coleman. They're there to discuss one of the core issues related to why the Real Organic Project exists. So this is like a dream. Great to be with these two amazing people. Um, start with, uh, with Dave Chapman here, who is uh, a hero of, a, of an organic grower and the founder of an organization called the Real Organic Project that I will let you speak to in, uh, uh, a little bit here. And just to say that uh, Dave is not only an incredible and very unique uh, specialty, specialty organic tomato grower, greenhouse grower, from which I've not seen any system quite like yours to the degree and amazing quality, uh, but also you're, you're a radical and uh, a community organizer in a way that I think is just really admirable for everyone in this room uh, to know more about. Um, and Elliot Coleman, who, to be honest, I, I don't know if I have the time to share with everybody how I feel about Elliot, but um, more than once in my life, he, he has uh, uh, really set me up for incredible success and, and has been a, a, a huge um, advocate and teacher for me uh, as an organic farmer and um, a human being just in general. So thank you for that, Elliot. The, the reason I think what, what I want to start the conversation, I'll just uh, pitch this to you, is that I'd known about your work and seen about what you'd done up there, and, but until the or Real Organic Project started, um, I hadn't had lots of connection with you. And maybe you could just talk about where the spark of this program came from and what you what got you out of the greenhouse uh, so strongly to to uh, start this start this organization and what it what it is to tell everybody what the real organic project is hi everybody um, <clears throat> that's a daunting introduction um, so I didn't start the real organic project a lot of farmers started it and it was just about a spontaneous combustion and it came after years of realizing that the USDA's National Organic Program was going downhill and uh, that the organic movement that we all cared so much about um, was being actually displaced um, and disenfranchised in, in the very organization that was, we had hoped would represent us. Like Elliot, I, I was not enthusiastic about the USDA taking that role on. They didn't like us very much. But um, I, I thought after a number of years I was wrong and that things were working very well. Because in Vermont, where I lived, 
all I saw was real organic, and the certification was a success, and the farms were a success. There were no CAFOs being certified, and there was no hydroponic being certified. But as I got drawn into a national conversation and started attending meetings um, of the National Organic Program, I realized that really we were in a lot of trouble. And um, it was, the trouble was much deeper than I had any idea. Uh, and, and a lot of what organic means was being lost. We, we were being colonized. We were being parasitized by large corporations because there was money in organic now. So it was our very success that was the threat. Um, it's a wonderful thing that, that organic had become uh, something that people were turning to in the stores and willing to pay a premium for. But that, that very act of uh, responding to something and turning away from the chemical food system was the very act that attracted actually many of the same corporations that were dominant in the chemical food system were now moving into the organic food system. And if they, if they moved in in a way that was genuine, which is to say that they really genuinely changed how they farmed, I would say, great, I don't care what their past is, I care what the future is. But that was not the case. They um, basically adopted the greenwashing techniques developed uh, in the 90s to um, deal with climate change, which was rather than oppose it, it's to say, yes, I see that this is important, I see there's a problem, and we want to be part of the solution. So give us a seat at the table. And as it turns out, when you sit down at the table with Godzilla, Godzilla has a louder voice than you do, and uh, much more influence over the outcome of the conversation. So that's why uh, the Real Organic Project began, because after years of trying, it, it seemed that um, uh, fixing the National Organic Program reform was not going to be a likely outcome. Um, I, I couldn't see a path to it. We, we had lost on, on every front, even when we got a recommendation passed by the advisory board in 10 years, from 2010 to 2020, all 20 recommendations were ignored or set aside. Um, and those recommendations, including not certifying hydroponic and getting rid of uh, chicken CAFOs, um, th they were things that we believe in, animal welfare. Mm -hmm. So we decided we would need to start something over again. And, and the question was, do we leave the word organic behind? and give it to them, um, or do we fight for it? And we decided to fight, so we started the Real Organic Project, and we made the debatable decision to use USDA certification as, as a foundation, and that we would do an add-on to that. And unfortunately, that disqualified my good friend Elliot and my good friend Barbara, wherever she is in here, from being certified with us because they wouldn't stoop to USDA certification, which I respect. But um, USDA certification does a lot of good work. It's just the little bit of bad work they do is terrible. And it's, you know, the vast majority of certified organic farms are really organic. A small number of certified organic farms are not really organic, and they sell a lot of what gets sold under the organic label in America. This thing that you're talking about, what, what can really, um, it is called the organic industrial complex. Um, this kind of idea, and the idea in 2001 when there was a national organic standard that was put in place, it really changed everything. But let's not be afraid of this term. Um, Elliot, uh, always because of the amount you've read and all that you've been involved in, you have a history, an understanding of the history of organic in a way that I think everyone in this room would, would really benefit to hear. Um, because I always associate it to uh, many, often back to Rodale or to uh, Sir Albert Howard um, during the Green Revolution in the 40s and 50s. But Elliot, um, you, you have the sort of 
predecessor to that and, and where that kind of comes from in the, in the world. Maybe you could speak to that a little bit and, and to what you actually believe the term organic means um, because it has certainly been what was such a sacred term to all of us has really just turned into a brand and not worth losing from my perspective. You're just indicating that I'm old. Well, that yeah. too, yeah. You're, you're uh, in all elder. my involvement with the Stone Barn Center, the best thing I ever did was to convince them to hire this guy as the farmer. Um, Thank you. When I began in 1965, uh, the counter uh, pressure against organic was just overwhelming. Every single scientist in the USDA, every single professor of agriculture at every single university in this country believed and taught that growing food without chemicals and pesticides was impossible. And what embarrassed them the most was that they were defeated by a bunch of hippies. <laughs> a bunch of hippies who said, wait a minute, that isn't the kind of food we want to eat, and it doesn't make sense. We should be able to grow it as it has been grown for hundreds of years, long before those chemicals came along. When those chemicals first came along, and we're going back to 1840, uh, a bunch of European health food types uh, within the next 20, 25 years noticed that the food didn't taste right, and they also learned what was being used uh, as pesticides, something called lead arsenate. Now, what species is stupid enough to spread lead and arsenic on their food before they serve it to themselves? So this <laughs> movement began, and it built up, and everybody looks back to the 1940s and to Sir Albert Howard and to uh, 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 J.I. Rodale, but they were just continuing this groundswell of intelligent thought about agriculture that had begun in Europe among health food nuts. So when I do run into agricultural professors today, I'm very careful to say back when they were claiming that this is impossible, that they weren't ignorant. They were merely under the impression that the ag education they had gotten in agriculture school was correct. It wasn't. It was totally biased by the influence in our nice capitalist society of the huge industries who had something to sell. And nothing is more threatening to those industries than a bunch of farmers who find that they can produce not only food but far better food without buying any of those products. Uh, I sometimes think that organic farmers are about as subversive uh, to uh, uh, the capitalist world as anybody else because they have proved it to be in the basic area of food production to be absolutely unnecessary. So how do, you know, old hippies, nutcases like me, uh, manage to do this? It is so simple. The systems of the natural world with which we work, that's the way it's, it's going out there. We're not adding anything. We're just looking at how the natural world is put together and figuring out how we can work with it to the benefit of food production. And it has happened spectacularly. Uh, I did want to make one other comment. People were talking about children being raised with livestock and everything. There was a British vet. You don't need to do scientific studies. There was a British vet back in the uh, 70s and 80s who wrote a series of books. His name was James Harriet, and the books were all creatures great and small. And in those books, he talked about what happened to dead livestock in England. 
So if you had a cow die or one of your pigs died, you took them to what was called the knacker's yard. Um, and I'm afraid I... No conozco una palabra en español por knacker, pero... In the knacker's yard was where they collected all these together and figured out how to dispose of them. And Harriet commented that he had never seen healthier children than the knacker's children, he, 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 all through these books. And uh, it was interesting, there's a group here from medical thing, because they, there were two Greek gods, goddesses, uh, involved in health. And one was a woman named Hygieia, and was a, a male goddess named Asclepius. Asclepius was the god of let's call it surgery, uh, and Hygieia was the god of living correctly and not getting sick. Well, organic farming is following Hygieia. We keep our plants healthy by providing them with, with the proper uh, uh, growing conditions. And uh, the trouble with Hygieia and that whole idea in a capitalist society is that there's nothing to sell. The same way, the way I farm, I don't buy any inputs. There is nothing to sell. It's amazing we've done as well as we have. You're here. Uh, so I think that just this idea which seems so simple and holistic and has existed forever and actually didn't have an opposition until there was a product to sell, puts us in today. And um, I was just, I really relish receiving these blasts, these newsletters that, that Dave and others in the Real Organic Project are, are writing. and. This morning, there was a, a really good one about um, how the U.S. just digs its heels in, I mean, not just in this article, but over and over and over again, on some really good practices that the EU is actually engaging in. Um, you know, we're not going to solve this problem because organic is a, an international concept. This is a, a global concept. And yet, our strength as a country and this as, as long as we dig our heels in and reduce the, the term, it sets the standard for everyone. But maybe you could speak to what, why that was an important thing to be getting out to the farmers and everyone who's advocating for this work, to, the difference between this, this farm to fork, or, or forgetting the term. Yeah, farm to fork. Mm -hmm. So the EU has, has um, as part of their uh, Green Deal concept that the EU government is, is promoting, um, kind of the centerpiece of it is called Farm to Fork. Mm -hmm. And um, it's committing to a 50% reduction in pesticides. And uh, it's, I think it's committing to take organic agri agriculture to be 25% of the acreage of the EU. These are um, really, really strong goals. Um, and if you think about this in terms of, of the economic forces we're dealing with, they are radical. Um, and the response from the USDA has been, um, from the very beginning, over my dead body. This will not happen on my watch. So um, this is a real fight, and it doesn't just affect the US and the EU, it affects the whole world. Um, they're very much both looking at the world market, both um, for selling things and for buying things. And, you know, the Bear Monsantos very much want to sell their products to every farmer in the world. So we're talking about trillions of dollars are being fought over in this, this thing that can seem unimportant. I mean, I think most Americans have never heard of Farm to Fork and don't know what that is. But it's going on, it's a serious fight. And you know, we need to remember, no matter what we do, 
we have tremendous influence. We are the biggest market for organic food from all over the world. And what we allow, what we say we require, very much impacts what the future agriculture will be in the rest of the world. There are other people who are, are trying for a different kind of thing, what I would call real organic. And there's a fight going on. And as, as Bill McKibben said, it's a fight over money and power, as it always is. So we're, we're off to the races. We're, we're still off to the races, and we'll always be off to that race. We're never going to, to win that, but we don't necessarily need to lose it. What I've come to recognize here, and I certainly learned this um, from all the amazing people that we've worked together on here, is that the farmers are not going to solve this problem alone. And you're talking to a room here today of doctors, chefs, artisans, thinkers, writers, a whole range of people, and that's, this is a, in many ways a cross-section of our community. So what is the, what is the step? Because it, would be, it seems like it's almost enough to say, well, organic seems to be growing. Isn't that a good thing, that there is more organic acreage all the time? And maybe that's happening because the standard is being compromised. I, I see um, a lot of real organic farmers being pushed out of business right now. There, there's some growth, but there's also shrinking. Maybe people in this room know that Horizon Dairy is dropping 89 organic dairy farmers from New England, 47 of them maybe are from New York. And those farmers pretty much are facing bankruptcy in a year when they lose their contracts. Horizon is the major milk, organic milk vendor in the U.S. You can find their cartons in most stores. They're owned by Danone, um, a French multinational, who has committed to being a B Corp, a beneficial corporation. So um, y y there's, a lot of, there's a lot of strangeness going on. When we see organic growing, part of the reason it's growing so quickly is because it's getting cheaper and cheaper. And it's getting cheaper and cheaper because the cost of production is going down because it's not really organic. And um, so I love to see organic grow. I would like to see the whole country be 100% organic. That's, that's our goal. But it's not enough to have it be labeled organic. It needs to actually be organic. And organic food is going to cost more. So um, on the shelf, the growth will be slower. It's going to cost more because it's worth more. And Dave, you need to mention that the reason High Horizon is ready to drop all these small New England farms is they are the worst uh, 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 lawbreakers against the organic milk uh, laws because they have these huge farms out west with 40, 20 to 40,000 cows no chance they can ever graze, and yet they have uh, bribed, uh, subverted, whatever nasty word I want to think of, the USDA, into not enforcing uh, the laws that say that organic dairy cows have to graze. Even though there is a uh, organic watchdog, the Cornucopia Institute, which raised money, uh, spent a good bit of it, hiring uh, planes to fly over and photograph some of those huge dairies uh, over the course of a week, and the cattle were never out grazing. And they took those, information, those photos and that information to the USDA, and the USDA basically ignored it. The Washington Post didn't ignore it, so um, it made for some pretty amazing articles back in 2017. Um, and those, those articles truly ruffled the water, but they did not change the policies and the enforcement of the USDA. We're going to have to do this ourselves. Uh, our goal, of course, is ultimately to reform government. We must make that our goal, but our immediate goal, that's not our strategy. Our strategy is to create an alternative to that. There is a difference 
uh, the way the food is produced. And uh, back in the uh, 18th century, as industrialism came in, the industrialists tried to take over and produce everything. And there was a whole movement uh, led by a Brit named William Morris. It was called the Arts and Crafts Movement because they were suggesting that machines can never make beautiful things. People uh, have to be involved. Uh, uh, and that the word manufacture begins with M-A-N-U, which comes from hand. It isn't called uh, uh, machine facture. But he had a phrase in there and that I loved. He, he said, the people who are doing it, with, with the people who are doing it right, there is a conscious, sensual pleasure in the work itself. And that's the way I feel every day as a farmer. It's hard work. I've been doing it for 55, six years now. But there is a conscious, sensual pleasure in the work because I know it's worthwhile, I know it's benefiting people. And I suspect that's what keeps an awful lot of chefs going day after day. Any words for this group before we open up for questions? How can they respond to this? And we have this whole group okay. here. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we could change the world on this one just with the people in this room. Um, it, it doesn't really take millions of people to change things. It takes some, it takes some people, but I don't know, I've, I've heard there are maybe 120, 150 people here. Um, if everybody here, you, you, you're an amazingly, uh, you know, biologically uh, articulate group. Um, that's why you're here. So you, you already know most of what I would say, but uh, I agree with an earlier statement that, um, only when we come together can we change things. Um, somebody alone can make a beautiful statement, and, and of course we all change the people around us, but uh, if you have 100 people come together, then you very quickly have 1,000, and then you very quickly have 10,000. You know, our ideas do spread like a beneficial virus. And um, so the people in this room, please join the Real Organic Project, become a friend, um, it's a, there's a thing online, and tell your friends about it. Get ten friends to do it, and read the articles, read the paper, you know, the, the letters. We sent out a weekly letter, Lindley Dixon or myself writes it, um, and we've got a lot of them. So you can, you can get an education. My poor sisters know all about this because they're <laughs> forced to watch everything we put out. You can too, um, and together we can, we can create change. You guys have any questions for these two? Hello. If you're using uh, USDA organic certification as your baseline, what are you building upon for the Real Organic Project certification? Where, where do we go from that USDA to get to Real Organic certification? Well, it's going to be enforced. <laughs> but in, in practice, I guess, is more my question for if you were a farm. Our, our standards are, are pretty simple. Um, as well as being certified, so we don't have to go through all that um, checking of paperwork. We require that people actively be maintaining and improving the fertility of the soil, which, as Elliot says, is just what is already in the law, meaning you can't be hydroponic and be certified organic. You can't be soilless producer. Um, you can't be a CAFO. Uh, if, if the cattle need to genuinely go out on pasture. Our standards for how much, how much grass needs to be part of the diet is a bit higher than the USDA's, but it's not radically different. It's just that they're not enforcing their standards. So those are the, the main things that we do, and we're going to be aware if somebody is feeding grain, we'll do our best to make sure that it's actually organic grain. Uh, a great deal of, those, of the CAFO production in America is being fed imported grain that is inexpensive and not really organic. And um, this is one that Congress has pushed the USDA to act on. It's been years now. They still haven't acted. They, they keep promising they're about to. So we're really looking at 
you know, people have said, is this organic 2.0? And I would say no. This is organic 1.0. We're just trying to get back to real organic. I, I believe there is a 2.0. I believe that we can all become better farmers, much better farmers. And, and Elliot was telling me about traveling around with Jack today and seeing all the uh, amazing improvements and innovations here at Stone Barns. So uh, it's not the end. This is the starting place. We have 860 farms certified with us across the country um, so far after three years. We'll, we'll do better with support. Certification is free for, with us, so um, cost is not a barrier. And, and Dave, the, the scandal about the fake grain coming in, the same reporter from the Washington Post who wrote about the, the scandal with the CAFOs not letting the animals out to graze, also, even though the USDA said, gee, we've tried to look into that uh, uh, complaint that there's uh, uh, fake organic grain coming in, we haven't been able to find out anything. Uh, Peter Wariski, <laughs> all you'd need to do is send a good reporter after it, found out everything. And the Europeans, uh, one of the hugest certifiers of organic grain in Europe until they caught on to it was a group on the island of Malta. Malta? And they were shipping out hundreds of thousands <laughs> of tons of organic grain and it was coming from Eastern Europe somewhere and they were just uh, transshipping it. Anyway, uh, you have to keep your eyes open. And if you wonder what I tell people, uh, because uh, the town we live in has a perfectly wonderful food co-op, but I say if you go in there today and buy raspberries, strawberries, blueberries, tomatoes, they're all hydroponic, I don't want to uh, make those people unhappy. So I say if you want to be sure of the quality of your organic food, buy it from a local neighboring farmer. And uh, you have a 99.44% a uh, assurity that you're getting good food. Like from this guy. Yeah, so uh, to go off that, um, like majority of consumers are not going to be able to have direct access to, you know, that local farmer where they can buy, I mean, 99% sure. So... It seems like the major problem is like the transparency of the food system and the consumer not necessarily knowing where their food's coming from. What is the solution to that? Like how is the everyday person who's going to the grocery store, how are they gonna be able to you know, have that transparency and be able to fi find out exactly where something is coming from? First they can start a garden, start growing their own. It's pretty straightforward stuff. As I said, it was a bunch of uh, old hippies who were able to prove the USDA experts wrong. So this is fairly simple. And the neighborhood farmer, well, an awful lot of people in New York City go to that large uh, market where Peter Hoffman always went. Yeah, I mean, the, a lot of farmers are, are bringing the food in, so it isn't necessarily that far away. And very often people, in the past, people who wanted to play golf got together and started golf clubs. So maybe people who want to eat should get together with a, some local farmers and start their own food club and dictate uh, the rules and how it's done. Uh, uh, I'm an old rock climber. If you're an old rock climber, you realize nothing is impossible. And I take that attitude towards solving problems in the world today. I've heard that uh, farm is the new golf, so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Elliot is describing what we used to call co-ops. Um, before they became stores, we used to have food buying clubs and we would order stuff from farmers that we trusted and divvy it up in, a, in somebody's, you know, um, mudroom and, and put it in boxes, kind of like a CSA. Um, 
And I, 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 I find myself going back towards that because I'm finding that the food, even though there's an amazing diversity of choices, it appears, in the supermarket, that many of the choices that I want aren't there. Um, and because I know this story, but it's, a, it's an invisible story, I know the farmers going out of business and I see what they're being replaced with. That is the purpose of the Real Organic uh, Project, creating a label that says Real Organic Project, certified by. Um, and and we, hope to, we hope to have that succeed. My goal is not to create a new brand. I think we need a label that we can trust, or many labels that we can trust. Europe has a number of um, add-on certifications to their base organic. And um, by and large, they're highly respected, and, and people rely on them and count on them. I think their base is, is much better than our base. So, uh, you know, we, we have a long way to go in, in this regard. Um, as as uh, Dave and Jack said, uh, we've never... Uh, certified with the USDA because I knew when it started that it was going to turn into the uh, uh, illegal mess it is now. And, but I refused to give up the word organic. So the sign at the entrance to our farm says guaranteed real organic. It's all one word. And somebody said, how is that spelled? And I said, R-E-A-L-O-R-G-A-N-I-C. And they said, well, you can't use the word organic. I said, I'm not using the word organic. I'm using the word real organic. <laughs> I said, it's a neologism. One of the way you win articles is to throw big words at people. And they said, what's, what's a neologism? And I said, well, you remember your Greek, don't you? Neo means new, logos means word, a neo logo, a neologism from Greek is a new word. And how can they tell me I can't use a word I invented. <laughs> um, the, uh, people get too scared of, of bureaucracies like the government. And uh, uh, you know I've had that sign up there for 15 years. The, the black helicopters have not arrived yet. <laughs> and uh, I, again, I'm an old 60s hippie. You got to go and confront these things anyway. <laughs> I will be there when the helicopter comes. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll be there at the gate for sure. Yeah. Uh, well, just to that point, um, to, to say that, and also to maybe help to answer that, what we're learning here is that you don't necessarily need to be in the field to know your connection to it, but you do have to have connection to the soil. And that an intact food culture is one that people have contact to. Uh, I always think about this thing where, you know, the degrees of separation is the problem, because we don't know what to ask for and we're being fed. Um, we have to get ourselves engaged in that. And the certifications are really valuable because of the, the degrees of separation that we all have from our food system and why Elliot doesn't certify and why I don't certify. And in many ways, because we have that contact to our community, the questions are close. It's like, if I'm in a backhoe and I'm digging, compared to if I'm using a trowel. I care much more about the worms when I have that trowel in my hand and I'm digging through that space and I'm you know, digging a trench. And so we have a food system that's a giant excavator and we're not touching the space and we can't make that human connection to it. So there's a lot of people in this room that have community gardens that I've seen that are beautiful, that are changing people's lives. They may not be feeding everybody in your community, but they're bringing inspiration to the entire community and bringing you closer to what we need as a community. Yeah. There, there are, um, I don't know if anybody's read Paul Hawkins' book, Blessed Unrest, but I like it. And it's, it, it describes a, a, a thousand, a hundred thousand movements, different movements, protest movements, movements towards creating an alternative, they're all going to the same ultimate destination, but they're all over the world, and they're organized in a very fractured and, uh, uh, well, true diversity, which is health. You know, diversity is health. It's a hallmark of health that, that we need to have a, a lot of voices. We don't need one voice. 
We don't need to have one voice speaking to the USDA because that voice will ultimately always become corrupted. It's just how things work. So we need a lot of voices and we need a lot of models of how to succeed from very small farms. But I'm not, I'm not ready to give up supermarkets you know, to, to, the voice, to the forces of evil. I mean, I think that most people get their food in a supermarket and until we develop alternatives, that's where they will. That's where my kids go get their food. I want them to have the choice of good food. And um, I think that, you know, one of, the, one of the tragedies but opportunities of the organic movement is that there are millions, millions of people now buying organic and they want real organic. They don't want walganic, they want real organic. Some people are happy with, with whatever, but a lot of people want exactly the food that you're growing at Stone Barns. That's what they go to the store to buy. And if they had the opportunity, that's what they would buy and they would pay extra for it if they could possibly afford it. And if they couldn't, they'd wish they could because that's the food that they want. So we have this huge market of, of people who want what the very farms that I see being driven out of business want to supply. And that's a tragedy and an opportunity. If we can connect those, I think everybody gets more of what they want, except for certain corporations which lose some money in the process. All right. Um, may I uh, send everyone off on a note of humor? <laughs> As always, please do. <laughs> Good. Um, if you've heard me tell this story before, forgive me. But um, a few years ago, uh, a good friend of the movement and I and Barbara were sitting around our kitchen drinking beer and trying to figure out uh, what we would do if we lost the word organic to the USDA. And we were thinking, well, we have to come up with a new word. And we went through everything uh, that had to do with health and nature and everything. But we came down to biological agriculture, which it is. It's not a chemical agriculture. And then that got down to bio-ag. And then in one of those moments of beer-fueled brilliance, we came up with the answer. B-I-A-G-R-A. <laughs> By Agra and Barbara, who is really good with slogans, came up with the slogans. Put the organ back in organic. A new high in sustainability. And I leave you with that. That's the new word. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you will subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a rating and review so that others can find us too. A video version of this interview is found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode 83. Please join us next time when we'll hear from farmer, activist, and writer Liz Henderson, a founder of Peacework Organic CSA, one of the oldest CSAs in the United States. She farmed at Peacework for over 30 years and is also the author of a seminal work on CSA farming called Sharing the Harvest. Her life's work centers on organic food and farming as well as fairness throughout the food system for workers and farmers in their relationships with buyers. To support this podcast and our certified farms, become a recurring donor at realorganicproject.org, and you'll get the benefits of being a real friend, including our book club, where you can ask many of our favorite authors your questions, including Dan Barber, who is our next book club guest at 6 Eastern on October 17th. See you next time. <laughs>